random pipelines that's the video of today you might be wondering random pipeline is a huge topic how this guy gonna cover everything in a single video the response is no I will not so this will be a series of videos which will come probably in every month and this will be about explaining the render concepts because in tutorials either in shader graph tutorials or shader writing tutorials we are creating certain things nodes or scripts um, but do we really know why we're doing certain things in the way that we do in the series we will dive into how rendering works in unity at the first video we will start by looking into the shader stages then we will cover color spaces and some very common lighting modes then finally with that knowledge we're gonna look into render paths and see the benefits and gotchas between them so without further ado let's begin all right first of all let's start with the shader stages so this can vary a bit depending on your graphics API which is either OpenGL or HLSL let's say the DirectX so or there's Vulkan but we'll come to that later in the first stage in the shader and the rendering pipeline supposed to be something that we gather the geometry right to do that our CPU gathers the relevant information of this mesh data from your object, your model, and then pushes it into the GPU memory. So the GPU memory will hold the vertex data and some color information and your other mesh information. And after the geometry gets ready, the first stage that will be executed by your GPU is vertex shader. So the vertex shader is responsible from accessing each one of those vertices in your model and then doing some kind of operation with them. This operation can be changing the space from its local mesh space to the world space of the Unity or you can change it to the screen space which is 2D. You can also set other variables such as vertex normals by tangents such as what we do in the uh, Spider-Man video or you can set vertex colors. You don't have to rely on textures and stuff and you can just use vertex colors that can be created by your modeling program so after you get your stuff ready and make your operations in the vertex shader you have to transfer that as an output and use it in the further stages the next big stage before rendering that mesh into the screen is fragment shader but before the fragment shader there are two more stages that are completely optional, which means you don't have to use them if you don't need them to, but you need to use vertex shader and fragment shader to actually draw a mesh to the screen with the conventional methods. So I said two additional methods that can be useful and can be used optionally. Let's start with geometry shader. Geometry shader can access to predefined primitives and manipulate them which means you can dynamically add new primitives that add gem to them. The main difference between vertex shader and geometry shader is that geometry shader can access to primitives rather than only points. Once you specify the input parameter type, let's say for each triangle as an example, geometry shader will run for each one of those triangles in your object. This way you can calculate additional data such as normals or add additional geometry to per primitive such as more triangles. As an example, let's say you want to have grass for each vertex on your terrain. Instead of having a huge model that contains all grass vertices and pushing them to the graphics memory and causing bandwidth problem and possible lags, you can generate those grass meshes on the fly at the geometry shader. This way, you push less information to GPU and run your vertex stage faster. But you might be asking, what's the catch? The catch is, imagine that you have millions of triangles on a single object and you run the geometry shader for each triangle. This means you're gonna need to run the geometry shader 
for a million times for each one of those triangles, which is super inefficient. Because of that, even in newer GPUs for mobile, manufacturers don't bother to support the geometry shader in the hardware level. Additionally, geometry shaders are mostly not even supported for mobile platforms too. Although, we would still want to use the benefit of generating additional geometry. That's where the tessellation shaders come in handy, which was started to be supported by DirectX 11 and OpenGL for so the tessellation shader is responsible for dynamically subdividing existing faces of your object depending on your configuration. That's why it's called tessellation after all. One common use of tessellation is to dynamically scale the level of detail of a terrain based on distance from the camera. This scaling maintains the visual fidelity of a highly triangulated terrain with great performance. It comes right after the vertex stage and before the geometry stage, which means you can use both. The main difference between the tessellation and the geometry shader is, unlike the geometry shader, tessellation doesn't have to get a common primitive such as points, lines or triangles. Instead, you have control over it to decide the vertex count for something called patch. So patch is another type of primitive that you can get as an input in the tessellation shader phase. And you can specify how many vertices gonna be in there as a shape. So you can get a quad, you can get a triangle, you can get different shapes as a primitive shape. Talking about the stages, tessellation actually have two main programmable stage that called the whole shader, aka tessellation control shader, and the domain shader, aka tessellation evaluation shader. Tessellation control stage can decide patch shape, as I said, and in addition to that, you can also decide how much subdivision gonna be applied to your patch in the control stage using factors. Then tessellator fixed state generates the subdivided mesh and pushes the patches into the tessellation evaluation shader. Evaluation shader, in the other hand, as the name implies, can calculate interpolated surface data for those patches, such as normals, tangents, and UVs, and also create dynamic displacements for snow, mud, or ocean, whatever you want to do with it. After the tessellation stage, geometry shader gets executed and it's followed by the rasterizer and the fragment shader. The fragment shader actually shows the entire geometry information to your screen. It's doing that with something called rasterizing process. So the rasterizing is gathering all the geometry which you have processed in the earlier stages and then um, projects that into the screen space which it's doing that with something called rasterizer rasterizer exists in every render platform and it's a fixed stage that covers this and after rasterizer converts your mesh data into screen space something called fragment created and it's, it's named as pixels and the pixel shader in the DirectX, but it's pretty much the same thing, let's say. So, pixel shader or the fragment shader is responsible for changing the color that will be displayed in those pixels or in those fragments about how it's gonna be displayed with the colors, the edges, and everything. Because you are not only gathering the screen texture, but you are getting more data. You still have access to some functionality such as mesh normals and you know vertex colors and other things, but you are working on the screen space now. The fragment shader is doing its thing in the screen space. And just so you know, most of the stuff that you do with the shader graph is getting done by the fragment shader. If you are not playing with the vertexes and accessing the position nodes and stuff, uh, generally it's being done in the fragment shader stage. You can prove that to yourself. If you go to Unity 
open up a shader graph shader and right click on it. When you do that, you'll see a section says generate shader code and show. So if you check it, if you click it, it's, it's going to open up the uh, generated shader. And when you look into that, you're going to see that it actually creates most of the stuff as fragment shader code. After the fragment shader, Z cooling is applied and post processing stuff can be executed before printing the pixel into the screen. And after that, our overall shader stage gets completed, which means we can finally see the final render image on the screen. With that being said, that covers all the topics uh, of today's video. If you like this video, press plus the like button. Well, I can't say that anytime in videos, so please press the like button. And if you want to see more videos like that or shader tutorials, which I have it, I'm going to come in a nice tutorial in next few videos. Um, if you want to see those, please uh, consider to be a subscriber to my channel from somewhere here. Um, that's all for today's video and I'll see you in the next one.